Welcome to tonight's Cemetery Salon. I'm Sharon Peka, an English professor and a lover of historic cemeteries. In 2016, I established River City Cemeterians after noticing that other cities had cemetery featured meetups. In the spirit of build it and they will come, I organized a group that visits regional cemeteries and began giving tours of historic cemeteries in Richmond, Virginia. During the pandemic, when tours were canceled to help stop the spread of COVID-19, I started researching women writers, buried in cemeteries, first locally and then throughout Virginia. On November 15th, my research comes to fruition with the publication of Women Writers Buried in Virginia. This is my little book. Through the History Press. Um, as the pandemic is still disrupting safe group gatherings, publishers have encouraged book release parties to be held virtually. I'll also note that the ladies who are here tonight were not in the same city, were not even in the same state. So the virtual salon is actually functional in that sense as well. Um, I'm this host, I'm, tonight I'm hosting this cemetery salon and it's in the same style as a literary salon where like-minded women gather to discuss a specific topic. The Literary Salon was an informal educational setting for women where they were able to exchange ideas, read their own works, and listen to the ideas of other intellectuals. For this salon event, the topic is women and cemeteries. In full disclosure, I am trying to promote my book, so I'll be discussing my forthcoming publication, but in the true salon fashion, I want an open discussion about the topic. This is an open discussion about whatever the topic means to those who have gathered tonight. So the role of women in fields associated with cemeteries, the attention women receive in history, the neglect of women's voices, especially women of color, roles of women in death care industry, et cetera. So I am going to start um, by who I can kind of see on screen first. I've Tanya Kirkman, she's the head of life and death events, described as a unique event exploring matters of life, death, and beyond. History of mourning customs, death positive, paranormal, spiritual art, and more. Hi, thank you for having me. This is great. Thanks, thanks so much for coming. Yeah. Did you want to add anything else to your introduction? Maybe a plug for 2022? We're working on dates for 2022. So um, I'll just say quickly that the the inaugural the, the, first, the inaugural year was supposed to be 2020, and as everyone knows, that's when COVID-19 hit. Um, so we ended up going um, virtual, and um, we did that in 2021 as well. So I'm hoping for 2022 we can actually all see each other in person. So, but it remains to be seen. We're hoping. Yeah, I'm hoping so too. Yeah. We have Sarah Farr of Death Positive DC, which is the first organized death positive group in the Washington DC area. Death Positive promotes conversations around death and connects people around topics through social media and in-person and virtual events. Sarah started Death Positive DC in 2017 when she could not find any death positive events happening in the area. So again, build it and they will come. Yeah, exactly. I, um, well, I was really interested in pretty much everything related to death and um, death culture and cemeteries in the area. And I was doing all this Googling and I just couldn't find anything. So I started my own group and started holding all sorts of different types of events. And um, they range from death cafes to workshops on how to write your own obituary or how to create a living will. Um, we have also done a lot of cemetery events where we go to the local cemeteries and tour them. And I've participated in the life and death event with Tanya as well. And I've done some cemetery events through that event with um, Congressional Cemetery because they're the only cemetery in DC that does green burial. So I've done a number of virtual green burial events with them. So thank you for having me here tonight. Thank you for joining us. And I love Congressional Cemetery. Yes. So we can plug all the cemeteries. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Um, we have Cynthia Gaines, historian. Um, we attended graduate a graduate program in public history together at the University of Richmond. Um, Cynthia's research always impressed me. And in 2018, her research came to fruition with a state historical marker issued by the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, resources um, which was dedicated in Lynchburg. Cynthia, do you wanna talk about your, your research with that? Thank you for having me. Um, that project was part of a class that we had. And um, I'm proud to say that my grandfather, through my research, I found out that my grandfather was instrumental in getting children to school um, in the in a Rosenwald school in outside, just outside of Lynchburg proper, uh, Campbell County back in the early 1920s, I do believe. My grandfather um, bought buses to transport the black children to school because in Campbell County during that time, uh, black children were not bused to school by the county. And the school that they were taken to, the Meganson School, was a Rosenwald school that was funded partially by Julius Rosenwald. And there were also funds raised uh, in the neighborhood to support these children to be able to go to school. Was your grandfather Julius? My grandfather, my oh. grandf yeah, my grandfather's on the, on the marker because he was instrumental in getting the children to school. He bought buses. My, um, my dad and my uncles and a cousin drove those buses to pick kids up. In fact, my mother met my father on the school bus. My father drove my mother's school bus. He was nine years old or so. But um, my grandfather, um, Wiley Gaines, is on the marker. Uh, because he picked up the children and he charged the families like a dime or a nickel a week uh, to pick their children up and to take them to school. Um, how much was that for the time? I mean, that was a fairly low amount. That was that was probably a fairly low amount. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I'm I'm blown. Away. I didn't know that that was your grandfather. That's yeah. I, yeah. That was that was kind of a thing that I found at the end and. Um, uh, I had to verify it with my family members um, because my grandfather, Wally, he died probably a year or two before I was even born. Mm -hmm. So, and by the time I did the marker, my father was gone. So yeah, it was, I had to go back and talk to family, but the research was, was a lot of fun. I love it. Yeah. And what an awesome way to know your family member is to mm -hmm. learn about them through the research. Yes. That's awesome. All right, I have Barbara Crockett Legacy. Did I say yes? That? Okay, I'm gonna get it right. She's the recording secretary for the Friends of Shaco Hill Cemetery. She assists with fundraising, event planning, and also gives tours. And I would probably add many, many other things to that list. Being a small friends organization, but small but mighty, right? That's um, right. That's it, right. And yes. Yes, um, and, and thank you so much for, for having me tonight. Absolutely, and I do want to, like, I'm just going to say that Shaco Hill Cemetery um, was established in 1820, and it was the first cemetery that was entirely planned, open, and operated by using detailed record-keeping record by the city of Richmond, and I think that's a big deal because they have so many great records, um, and Barbara will be able to speak to that, but even before we turned on the recording, um, we verified that Barbara has 90 known ancestors buried in Shaco Hill Cemetery. I know she's super passionate about not only restoring grave markers that you know have weathered over time or been damaged, but also marking the graves that have not been marked um, is something special to her heart too. Absolutely. And one thing that we did do, um, and we hope to do it again once we're beyond COVID, is um, we had a successful ancestor um, discovery and appreciation day. And I can talk a little bit about that later as well. Love that. Marilyn Jean Perry has an academic background in English literature and gender studies with a focus on women's autobiography. 
Marilyn has a deep love for cemeteries and she spends a great deal of time in them locally, nationally, and abroad. Um, I believe, so here's where I have to verify. I believe we met on one of my night tours at Hollywood Cemetery. Is that right? I don't know if it was the night tour first. I know it was a tour. Okay. Um, so, but it might've been a night tour either way, but yes, you're correct. So I, I thought about it because I felt like we talked a lot while I was, you know, I would be like, yeah, I very much, uh, kind of grabbed you. And I was like, kindred spirit, we have all the things, blah, blah, blah. I don't care that anyone else is here. <laughs> I that too. Um, Marilyn also was my phenomenal woman in black in my book trailer. So I think you should watch it, not even just for the book, but just to see, I don't know if that was your acting debut, actually. You think there's a <laughs> crystal ball instead of a, of a teacup, but yes. That's right, it was, that was a lot of fun. Very much. Thanks for having me here, Sharon. Thanks so much for joining. We have Robin Simonton, Simonton, I didn't say it right. I messed it up. Um, and with a name like Keika, that I, I try to be sensitive about that, um, is the executive director of the historic Oakwood Cemetery in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, a genealogist and family historian, also a background in historical administration. Now, historic Oakwood Cemetery, which is a phenomenal cemetery, established in 1869, 72 acres, so it's a good place to walk. Um, it's also located on the boundary of the Oakwood National Historic District, which contains one of the largest collections of Victorian era homes in the country. As a collector of small things, um, I love the idea of a location having a collection of large Victorian era homes. Um, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, Oakwood Cemetery is um, older than the, the homes. Um, but uh, they are great neighbors and um, they use the cemetery as their own backyard. The, there's a, uh, there was just a pig picking in the, in our big front entry field and the Easter egg hunt for the neighborhood is held in our front field. Um, and, and my historian has published two books on Oakwood to Oakwood, the folks that lived in the neighborhood that are buried in the cemetery. So we um, have a lot of fun with the neighbors and, and their homes Actually, our longest serving superintendent lived in that neighborhood almost his entire career um, at Oakwood. So um, it's a great connection and we're, we're very, we have great neighbors on all sides, but that side is, is truly special to us. Plus it's an amazing walk, I mean, really. So yeah. and congratulations on your book. Thank you. But I, I do wanna highlight some things that Oakwood does and hopefully it will come up organically in our talk because I think it connects with some of the death positive parts as well. Um, do you want to explain? I, I'll, I'll just jump in. Like, can you talk about some of it? I mean, like, I think it was like last week that you had an event. Did I have an event last week? It's so hard to remember. You know, once you get through October, you're like, wait. <laughs> oh, so we did have our um, day, uh, our day of the dead, a friend uh, was up. Is that what you mean? Um, so for the past seven years, we've hosted um, an ofrenda put together by a young um, Hispanic woman that owns um, a very popular restaurant in Raleigh, Centro. Um, and we usually host the Day of the Dead 5K that runs from downtown Raleigh um, through the cemetery and back as a fundraiser for the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and every year our um, a friend gets bigger and bigger. Um, this year I, I bought an even bigger tent. <laughs> um, and next year we hope for it to encase the entire front entry field. Um, of the cemetery. And it is something that at first people were like, what are you doing? Um, and now families come and um, of all backgrounds, whether they have someone buried in the cemetery or not, come and place a photo on the ofrenda. I think we might clean out every um, garden center's mums um, <laughs> that we can find. But, um, and then on, the, on All Souls Day that evening, we host a big event and families can come in um, and light a candle and, and honor their loved ones. And it has become such a special part of our tradition um, that it's really an amazing, colorful uh, activity. I um, mean, sometimes, um, sometimes the weekend of the run and everything else, we also host a storytelling event, also as a fundraiser for the Boys and Girls Club. 
um, where about six or seven folks from different backgrounds and different cultures will um, come and tell a story about how death affected them. So it, it's, um, it's been an amazing partnership. And uh, we, we hosted the first Death Cafe in Raleigh years and years ago. Um, and we've now let a local funeral home take that over. Um, but this is still one of those death positive events that Sarah and Tanya know so, oh, so well that it just is an important um, part of who we are. I, I also want to point out that when I went to visit you, like right between getting my vaccine before Delta hit, and you know we all thought we were a little bit safer, um, that you all had a really beautiful way to acknowledge those who have struggled and lost people during the pandemic. Do, do you mind sharing a little bit about that? Sure. We actually, um, you know, we. We were, uh, we all have been affected by the pandemic in, in a million ways. And whether you lost a loved one to COVID or lost somebody during COVID um, or just really lost somebody, you know, all of our lives have been impacted. And so we um, took an idea that had been started at Lakewood Cemetery in Minneapolis, um, where they put um, ribbons on one tree and we spread them out through the, that front field that we use for so much. Um, we had families come in and write messages to their loved ones on cotton ribbons. And then we, we had the um, families tie those um, ribbons with their loved ones message um, all across the floor or whatever, uh, crepe myrtles. Um, and so by the end of it, we just took them down maybe just before October. Um, there were hundreds of ribbons on these trees. Um, and then we had a special uh, drug overdose awareness day where families who lost someone to um, a drug overdose could come in um, and write ribbons. It was on the day that there was a, a march in Raleigh. Um, and then we had a COVID um, Remembrance Day as well. And so by the end of it, we saved all the ribbons. I don't know what I'm gonna do with them, but by the end of it, um, we had a lot, a lot of ribbons and um, people were asking us to make sure that we could do it every year. Um, but I, you know, I, don't, I didn't really think about the families that lost someone to COVID, which of course is so heartbreaking, but all families who lost somebody during and continue to during this time, especially in the beginning when there were so many restrictions on how many people could come to a funeral. Um, you know, we, we even my own grandmother died during this time and we couldn't even gather for the funeral until months and months later. Um, so we know it, we, it impacted all of us. So it was just a way for all of us to kind of um, work another way to work out that grief. So kind of a heavy topic for us to start, but we all do have maybe lighter interests in cemeteries as well. But for many outsiders that aren't so connected with cemeteries, they think, you know, just the thought of a cemetery is um, spooky or weird. So I want to start with maybe your connection. Like, how did you all get involved with the topic of death, with cemeteries? with researching even, you know, family genealogy. Don't make me call on you. I, I was gonna say, I can start. <laughs> I didn't wanna jump in if anyone else would. Um, I'll just say, I, gosh, I was thinking about it, you know, in preparation for this. And it, it has to be um, a good 20 years now that I just started going to cemeteries to um, just, look around and enjoy, you know, the, the artwork and the ambiance and you're, you know, you're learning about people and history and all the things that, you know, you, you see as you walk through a cemetery. And around the same time as I was just sort of doing that, um, I started collecting items as well. So the first item that I bought, um, I'm originally from Connecticut. So I was, um, often I would go to Cape Cod, so there was this little antique shop in Cape Cod, and above one of their doors was this long sign, it's actually up here, you can't see it, but it said Shambaugh Cope Cemetery, an old painted sign with tin letters, I said, I want that, so that was the first thing I ever bought, and it, it was one of those funny things, it was either, like, I'll, it's either a phase, like I'll be collecting this death stuff for a little while and then I'll grow out of it or it'll be forever. And so it's been like 20 years, so it's not going anywhere. It's just getting like more and more. So so it that was happen. sort of how I started with everything. So, yeah. I can jump in. Um, I got interested in cemeteries 
um, kind of in a crazy way, I like to read obituaries. Obituaries tell a lot of information about a person um, in the, about three inches of newsprint. And once you go to a cemetery and start looking around, I love the headstones that tell a little bit more other than the day they were born to the day that they died because they had a lot of life in between that. And in the old city cemetery in Lynchburg, and I'm from Lynchburg, I went to that cemetery for the first time. I mean, I passed it all through my childhood going to church. But when I went to it the first time, it was probably about four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed at the information that they had on some of the obelisks and the information that the historians had found about the people that's buried there. And one that I, I've, there was a madam that's buried there. Her and her daughter had a house of ill repute. And one of the things that they had on the obelisk, it says they served everybody. And this was a, during a time when there was um, segregation, you know, black people didn't. And, and they made a point to say on that obelisk, they served everybody. And I thought that was the, that's crazy, but I love that. Well, I think that's, I, first of all, everyone loves a good madam story in a cemetery, right? I mean, I'm always like, who has a madam? Raise your hand, you know, I love it. <laughs> so, but I'm from the Midwest, really. And I grew up in a little town outside of Chicago where um, the little town cemetery of all of its founders were buried right there on Main Street in the downtown. And so as a kid, my mom would let me walk through the cemetery when she'd go to the bank or the shoe store, anywhere but the library. The library I'd go with her. And so I just found even as like a, a nine-year-old how amazing and peaceful it was, like you were saying, Tanya. And, and it was very tiny, but it was all the names of the people who the streets were named after in my town. And it was, I just thought it was amazing. And in undergrad, I, um, I went to the University of Hawaii and I answered an ad in the, an article in the newspaper about woman doing research on um, Hawaiian cemeteries and burial grounds. And I, I wrote her a letter because it was before email. I was like, I want to help you. <laughs> and she humored me and let me help her. And I was a researcher on her book. Um, in graduate school, I worked with Amish, the Amish casket maker and thought that was like the coolest thing ever, right? I mean, how many times you get to meet an Amish person and, and uh, their burial customs were amazing. Um, I just always thought they were outdoor museums and um, they tell stories of who's there and who isn't there and why, why aren't they there and um, women that, you know, maybe their headstones just say Mrs. Joe Smith as opposed to their first names um, and, and everything about what you were saying, Cynthia, the obituaries. I mean, you can fall down a rabbit hole in 30 seconds in a cemetery um, whether it be the monument art, the people who were buried there, the people who carved the stones. It's, since I was a kid, I just thought it was, there was no better museum than a cemetery. I'll jump in as well. I think um, for me, in terms of the cemeteries, when I was young, and I think I had this conversation with Sharon before as well. When I was young, I actually um, would go to the cemetery and we would have Easter egg hunts around Easter. And it was to see my grandparents who had passed along long uh, before I was born. But also, um, you know, we would, we would get together and, and have, you know, give flowers, put flowers on their graves. It was like a decoration day. So it was, it was very peaceful, but it was also kind of celebratory. So I didn't have that negative connotation until, you know, much later on when, when some close folks start dying, um, your close relatives and that sort of thing. And then once my mom passed unexpectedly when I was 21, um, I really wanted to research her ancestry. And she and my father had started that. And he had actually written a computer program on a mainframe. And it was a family tree program. <laughs> and it was the first of its kind that probably anybody had ever developed. And I've still got it. 
And so it was done with punch cards and um, the um, old paper, you know. Um, and so I still have copies of that, but it really helped me as I embarked on my family's research. And um, the further I went into it, the deeper I got. And, and you're right. I mean, you can just go so many rabbit holes with the research, but um, it's been a great, it's been a great um, experience for me. And at Shaco Hill Cemetery, I found out some of my mom's people were there, started with a handful and course now I'm up to 90 and it's just it's a crazy obsession at this point but I love it <laughs> that's amazing my background too is a little bit with like my grandfather was a genealogist and I remember having to go to these family reunions and they were always boring I always had to dress nice I wasn't allowed to play with the dog because if I got dirty in my dress all of that, but we would always go to the cemetery because my grandfather, you know, needed to find the family. And he called me Sweet Pea. So he, you know, as little as I was, he'd be like, Sweet Pea, look at this name, go find this person. And I would run around the cemetery and the family was there and no one was fighting. I don't know if there was, you know, because we were outdoors. Um, so I was able, I've always liked to be outside. So I was able to run around and you know find these names so I felt helpful as a little kid um I felt like I was part of this you know connection with the family and also my grandfather used to tell like these you know just random family stories so it was always you know as an English you know professor I love stories but now they're tied to a cemetery so it was always positive and you know even you know, going as a goth girl through, you know, school that, and also not a phase, <laughs> but it was never like dark and spooky. And I was also the kind of like goth kid that I was like, no, you don't sit, you don't sit on a cemetery, you know, like on a tombstone in a cemetery. That's just not right. Um, you know, taking pictures because it's cool and it's beautiful. Um, but I noticed like even in my book that there's a lot of trees. So I'm all about framing my pictures with these beautiful old trees. Um, so it was, you know, like it was always a, a positive family memory for me too. My, um, my dad is buried at a cemetery in DC. It's called Rock Creek Cemetery. And it's, yeah, it's so beautiful. Um, and so he died over 12 years ago now, but something that's been, so wonderful about like visiting him at that cemetery is like I feel a really strong sense of connection to place and watching the cemetery throughout the different seasons and just over the course of all the years and you know every time I go to visit much of it is the same but there's always something new and my kids are different ages so you know, experiencing the cemetery through their eyes as they grow up and the different, you know, as kind of as, as it relates to a death positive attitude, which I think just means <clears throat> an openness towards talking about death and being curious about death. Um, it's been really amazing to see how their questions about death and the cemetery and why is pop up there have evolved as they grow up. Um, and I just was there recently, you know, during the fall. It, it's just so beautiful. I just, and like some people were saying, um, I find it so peaceful to be there. It's just a real sense of calm for me, I think. And even getting out of the city, you know, I mean, like Rock Creek, many of these cemeteries were, you know, our garden cemeteries, our first part. So they were intended for people to go and visit and reflect. Um, when I do guided tours through Hollywood, there's some really beautiful monuments that look like large mirrors. And, you know, the symbolism is you too, you know, like as a reminder, we all pass and one day we'll be here. Um, we have our plot, my husband and I have our, our plot in Hollywood really important for us to 
to, you know, connect to place. It's a place that I've always loved. It wasn't always his plan. To, he was sort of like cremation ashes out into the sea or whatnot. But now he's very much like he will be buried there. I will be ashes, but buried there. And we like to visit our plot. Um, people think that's a little weird, but I sort of find it very endearing. This is a place that I love. We love our plot. Like there's this beautiful magnolia. It's um, sort of tucked away in a place that people could walk by and totally not even notice, um, you know, like a little hill. So I find it really beautiful and comforting. And I like the idea that when one of us passes, the other will have that positive memory of us being in that place. So I, I completely connect with that. Sharon, can I ask you, when was Hollywood integrated? Because a lot of the cemeteries in the South uh, were, were segregated. In fact, my parents are buried in um, a black cemetery. And my mom's side of the family is on one side. And then there's this little gravel road that separates an, another cemetery. And my dad's side of the family is buried in that cemetery. So, but my, my parents are buried together in the one on my mom's side of the family. But just out of curiosity, when did um, Hollywood get integrated? It was, it's the private cemetery, so it was never segregated by law or by practice. It was more, you know, the custom, why do you want to be buried with all the white people as a Black person? Um, but there were some people who, uh, you know, because it was established, um, you know, before the Civil War, but it wasn't a popular place until, you know, until Monroe was, you know, buried there. So, you know, any sort of servant or enslaved person probably would have been buried with the family. I can't think of any Black people of that time, but I know that there was a British servant who is buried um, with the family. And, you know, just the, it would be in a family plot. So they, I've asked before, like I wanted to know who was the first Black person who was buried in Hollywood. And they just don't have that kind of record because that wasn't, you know, it's not something that they noted. But, but to the, to their knowledge, you know, even today, it was never um, legally segregated, just probably by Richmond standards. Because old cemetery is there are there are black people that are buried in parts of old. Cemetery, an old city cemetery in Lynchburg, that you wouldn't think they would be buried there, and and they are acknowledged on their um, on a, if they're talking about if they were a doctor or whatever, uh, the historical plate that's there will say colored, mm -hmm. and I thought that I found that to be very interesting. They and I have it in the book, but I you know I have. A, obviously didn't memorize it, but there is a, it's a high percentage because that was where African-Americans in Lynchburg were buried. Um, so there's a high number, but, you know, we've, and they have pretty good records and they find, um, you know, more information as people start doing research, you know, they uncover that, but they know who's buried there. Um, and I have one woman who was um, Lizzie Hall, and her husband's name is on the monument just because she outlived everyone. So who of the family is there to, you know, pay the money to add to the monument. But she and her siblings are buried, um, you know, just around this, you know, beautiful obelisk. But, but I love that they have, they have weddings. They do all kinds of stuff. They have museums there and, um, you know, like a medical museum that I always have to skip, but they have an old hearse that, you know, horse-drawn carriage hearse. Um, and the big old swing. The, oh, the swing. If you ever go, it's like the smoothest swing. At, you, you're laughing because you know it's true. Like you get on it, you become this little kid. Um, you have to, I have a video of me on it, actually. <laughs> 
So I was like, you know, I heard this story and people were like, oh, you should, you should test it out. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, oh. so I have these too. The, Isn't the, that the cemetery that has the cookbook, the recipe book? They, I think they, they do. They sell one, but they also, got, they have the bees on the cemetery property. I have bees too, but I don't have, I think there's this old city cemetery, old cemetery, uh, Lynchburg, like with the black cover. It's a great, it's a great uh, recipe Yeah, I, book. they sell it, so it must be their cookbook. Yeah. Yeah. I have an odd co collection of books from that cemeteries published, and that's one of my favorites. <laughs> Tanya's shaking her head, and I'm now I'm wondering about what what else is in her collection. I, the, well, the the odd collection of books is sort of like I'm going, uh huh. <laughs> it's just sort of like, like you know weird like death cookbooks and you know like all sorts of just epitaphs and post mortem collectibles and mourning jewelry and just you know all the weird stuff you know. It's great. Even it's speaking, not weird. Speaking about great. um yeah. reading obituaries too. I have this old. I don't remember how how late it goes in, in period but it's sort of you know late victorian early turn of the century um book that somebody put together that has obituaries pasted in it but it's hysterical because the the cover um is like an embossed like santa claus so it's like this like christmas book of death you just keep flipping through it's all obituary so it's just, it's just funny so i find that really fascinating i have an employee whose mother clipped obituaries for like 40 years and she and the woman passed a few years ago and she brought the book in and it made me wonder like why did she save this one what caught her attention like there was one about the only man to survive both atomic bombs in japan he had he was at the first one and he got the heck out of town and then he was in his in his boss's office telling him about what had happened and he saw that same light out the window and he was the only person in the world that knew what that was because he had survived the first one. Mm -hmm. and, and it was in an obituary in Raleigh, North Carolina in the newspaper. And I was like, huh, I'm like, that's fascinating. But I did make, it did make me wonder like, why, why was this special to her? What caught her eye about this obituary? It was really, I mean, I, we read those obits for weeks. I mean, yeah. So cool. yeah, and if you know, you know, at least with that, you might have a context on who it is to maybe piece some of it together, yeah. but you know, all these years later, it's sort of like, yeah, what were they? Who were these people? They they just find it interesting. That, well, so. and obits back then were so much more than so many today. You know, yeah. because of how expensive they are. You learned a yeah. lot of information from an obit, like Cynthia yeah. said too. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. But I will add that there's a lot of inaccuracies in obituaries that were a huge struggle for me, even with. Um, you know, one of the interments, it was listed as Hollywood, but she's actually buried in Riverview, which is the cemetery next to it. Um, and people will argue about, no, she's there. No, she's not buried there. Like, I, you know, I have the page number of their, <laughs> their paper based book, you know, of, you know, the interment, and this is pre Civil War. So, um, but, you know, when I called to ask just to verify, He's like, hang on, I've got to get the book. <laughs> wow. I love that, you know, like, and I'm, I'm like, can, can you give me like, you know, a citation? And he was like, it's like page 125, line, whatever, you know, like, and I was like, okay, that's going to be in my notes. <laughs> well, you know, interesting thing about obituaries too. My great, great grandmother's obituary was clearly in, I think it was the Richmond Dispatch in 1866. And um, the problem with that was I went looking for it, said she was buried in Shaco Hill Cemetery, which made sense because the rest of the family was, couldn't find her, couldn't find her, looked for her for years. I thought maybe it was a mistake. Maybe she was at St. John's after all or somewhere else. And um, it was only when I decided to look in family plots at Shaco and I found her husband's family plot and she was recorded as Mrs. J.E. Mackinton, not Throckmorton. Completely annihilated her last name. <laughs> so there she was all along and um, she'd been unmarked. So that year, just a couple of years ago, I, I marked her grave with a beautiful pink marble tablet. It looks like a book opening. It's, it's really beautiful.
That is a pretty one. And I will say too, that that was another struggle that I had when doing research for my book was often, and I lived on newspapers.com. I love, yes. I, and it was hard because you're supposed to be focused, but then you're like, wait, this story is so interesting. <laughs> um, but it was hard with last names for women. And if they changed or if they were referenced by their husband's name, and even who their friends were, that was a struggle for me to figure out, well, what is this woman's name? She too was a writer, but who is she? Well, one thing, and I'm glad we're talking about this, that, that really struck a chord with me that I wanted us to talk about, and, and you are, is, is I can sum it up in one word, and that's obscurity. You know, women basically... They had no name. And, and if you did not know their maiden name, I mean, even with research, it's hard to find a woman's maiden name. It really is very, very difficult. A yeah, lot of times on, it was initials, you know? I was on newspapers.com today at work looking at um, a family, like trying to figure out the family tree of someone buried at Oakwood. And I, it always makes me so sad. And I know it's of the time, like you're saying, Barbara, but like it, the woman's obituary had her husband's, she was Mrs., and then whatever her husband's full name was. And I mean, I happen to know what her name was because of my burial records, but just think of the obscurity, like you're saying, that she doesn't even get her own name mm -hmm. um, in her obituary. <laughs> you know? Like it's so, it's so women's history is so hard. I think there are some great stories of a woman, a young girl um, who caused, she was drowning with all of her skirts on in a, in a pond or a lake. And these two young men tried to save her. They drowned. She survived trying to find her because she went on to get married. We can't, we can't figure out what happened to her. You know, you'd love to know what the rest of her life was like, but you know, we never could find her again in records. So it is, um, it's so important that you, Sharon, are telling women's stories because so often they're not the people that historians talk about. Um, you know, there's a lot of lost folks in history and, and women are, are just one of those uh, groups. Absolutely. One of the things that, and I try not to use the word anger, but it does anger me. Um, my, as a lit professor, my research is actually on deaf characters in adolescent literature. And there was a, a woman, she's on the back cover. That's how important she was to me. Um, she was in my doctoral dissertation. And for years, she, as I walked through Hollywood Cemetery, she's buried three feet from the road where I walked back and forth. Um, she was a West Virginia writer, Montague's her last name. And she was, a, you know, she was a big figure in the Virginia School for the Deaf, her brother was the superintendent and she just was you know someone important to me and there's no there was no documentation on anything and it's not Hollywood's fault because history is you know retold by men again and again um, but it it makes me angry that I didn't get to learn about these women. Um, another one Ann Spencer like out of Lynchburg you know Cynthia's heard me go on about this Jesus, there's like the people that matter to me, like, you know, I really want to emphasize, um, you know, she was, Ann Spencer was huge in the civil rights movement. I'm from Virginia. We took school trips everywhere. Why didn't I hear about Ann Spencer when I was a kid? Well, so, let me, I'm sorry, but I, I have to jump in. My mother, I believe my mother was in a garden club with Ann Spencer. I went to high school probably less than five miles from Ann Spencer's house. And I'll be 60 years old on Tuesday. So I was in school a long time ago. We never, ever read anything by Ann Spencer. All I knew was there was a lady named Ann. Um, my mom said she wrote poetry and she was in her garden club. That is all I knew. And I'm curious, um, one day I'm gonna go to her house to tour it. I'm curious, I understand she wrote phone numbers on the wall and I'm, I'm gonna look to see if my mother's phone number is, <laughs> our home phone number is on there. I didn't, I didn't even think about, that's awesome. But 
so she had this amazing writer retreat, which was a garage that had been converted. Think imagine, like think this like beautiful she shed. Um, but when you go to the house, I mean, it's in the suburbs, you just walk behind the house and there's this beautiful garden. As a gardener, like I was just so overwhelmed. But even there's a pond and there's a bus that has, it's a little, um, I want to say like it's a golden head, but that was a gift from W.E.B. Du Bois. So she was, yeah, like that was a salon, like people when they try, she helped, you know, start the NAACP there. And, you know, at that time, Black people traveling couldn't stay in hotels. So where did they stay? They stayed with the Spencers. And I just, you know, like um, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, just so many names have been in that garden. And you can walk back in there and her writing retreat is basically frozen in time. You can look in the windows and see like her desk is, is, the house is open, you know, sometimes by family or by appointments, but you can walk in the garden and there's, you know, different interpretations. It's like a little, I mean, it's a museum, but you know, yes. Yeah, so even you growing up in the area, we just, and her poetry is so beautiful. And when they've redone the garden over time, some of her poetry is actually in the walkway on, you know, stone. So it's really beautiful. Well, and I think that, you know, women lost to history, but women of color lost to history. You know, I was going through, um, I, was, I was recently asked to give um, a tour on diversity at Oakwood Cemetery. And we now, you know, like Hollywood, we were, were never part of our um, written guidelines, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we were necessarily open to everyone for a long time. But now we are, and we have been for a little bit of time. And trying to find women of color who I know rest in Oakwood Cemetery, but our obituaries in today's world are very different. And, you know, a guy found a, an African American man who was the first African American sergeant at arms for the North Carolina legislature. But the women are harder to find. It may not be that they, maybe just be they didn't put all that in the obituary or they didn't have an obituary. I'm like, I know I have amazing women here. Like, tell me your story. <laughs> so, because you uh, you want to be able to tell everyone's story. You don't want anyone lost to history. As as generations pass and those stories get further back, it's going to be even harder to find them. I want to be mindful for of of our time too. So I want to start kind of closing. What is your hope for the future of cemeteries and you know women and cemeteries? based on our theme. I'll jump in and say that um, so much uh, in terms of amazing links and things that have been shared already, but what Cynthia and Robin were speaking to specifically of this idea of cemeteries as kind of this living outdoors museum of symbology and story and ways of learning not only about the individuals that are there, but also ourselves just through what we're drawn to. Um, I recently read an article about, um, uh, for some markers, they're starting to incorporate QR codes, which <laughs> I have feelings about. And I just started thinking um, how extraordinary it would be to really be able to easily, excessively, potentially relatively inexpensively compared to like writing everything out on a marker stone, be able to walk around and get photos and a little bio, possibly art, song, articles, you know, about an individual through these more high tech stones. Um, and really, again, what that means in terms of agency, people being able to plan, being able to say, these are the things I want to know that I'm remembered for through my marking. And um, so that's that's something that right now, I mean, it's, it's very futuristic, high tech, but still um, beautiful to consider having that greater form of engagement um, as a, as a very lived possibility um, in the actual now. <laughs> I'm 
I'm laughing because recently Cynthia and I talked about if we were techies, we would have what's called a pop-up historian um, on social media when we see these pictures. We're like, we want to know more. Like, don't just leave us there. Um, but I also think that that, you know, talking about how you want yourself to be, you know, presented is, is very much, um, you know, Sarah's kind of realm of death positive and how we need to reflect on our lives now and how we want to even think of ourselves. Like, it, I think about obituaries too. Oftentimes it's not your work that's mentioned, at least I hope not. Um, it's, it's those things that really meant something to you. So for me, that's what I love about cemeteries is sometimes it gets people to stop and think like, what am I doing um, now? I'll jump in. I, I think one of the things, and I haven't talked really about it tonight, but my love of finding ancestors really started in rural North Carolina, finding some of my ancestors there. And I, I think the thing that concerns me for the future is our youth, our young people, and whether they have an affinity for that and to save those cemeteries and those small rural communities. A lot of rural communities are dying out. And um, when that happens, then just about everything in that community, in that county, in that locality, just kind of go by the wayside. And, and cemeteries are one of those things that are often neglected. Um, I recently got a Department of Highways map from the 1950s. Huge thing, I got at auction. And it has different cemeteries embedded in this map. Well, good luck finding them today, you know, because a lot of them are so deep into the woods um, and just so covered up. And some of it's been, you know, it, it's it's been it's been utilized for other purposes. You know, businesses have come in. So I think really just just really teaching the next generation up about how important it is to save and preserve you know, those final resting places of our ancestors, both men and women. Well, and I think, you know, women are the drivers of um, cemetery planning um, in couples that is women that drive the um, boat, that drive the car about who's, you know, where we're gonna be buried, are we gonna pre-plan? Um, they're, the, they're the decision makers. And so Sarah's work is really groundbreaking, I think, because it helps educate our community about um, making, you know, understanding what what decisions are to be made, not to be afraid of making these decisions, um, and having conversations about it. Um, people who have participated in death cafes or death activities um, are so much better prepared for when, I mean, we're all shocked when the inevitable happens, but people who have a vocabulary for it um, seem better equipped to be able to make these decisions um, every single time that I, in, in the, with the job that I do. And so I'm always grateful for these conversations about death that women um, and men participate in, but knowing that women are the drivers most of the time, um, and we don't always feel like we're the drivers in our day-to-day -day job, sadly, that these conversations, like what we're having tonight and what Sarah and Tanya do, um, and what all of us do in our own realms are so important because it gives people the vocabulary and the courage to be able to have these difficult conversations. I think doctors and hospice nurses thank all of us around the country for having these kind of conversations. It, it makes it a little easier for people during a difficult time. I would yeah. like, I would I like really to say, go ahead. Oh, I, well, I was just going to add really quickly that, um, you know, talking about including the next generation, I really love some of the stuff that Congressional Cemetery does to interact with the public and get people to come in because, um, you know, once you get people in there, they might start thinking about things like, wow, well, what would I want my headstone to look like? And then, you know, and every time you have to think about like, mm, what would my headstone look like? You have to think about the fact that you are going to die one day and you have to have this like moment of remembering your own mortality, um, which, you know, we're all really good at avoiding even me a lot of times. <laughs> um, but, you know, I also, um, I 
take my kids to all sorts of cemeteries when we go on trips. So I feel like they're a generation, I don't know that all families do that, but our family, like we hit any old cemetery I see when we're driving up to Maine, I'm like, stop the car. Like we have to go see this. So, um, you know, they've grown up feeling really, I think, you know, comfortable about those topics and comfortable being in different cemeteries. Um, and in where I live in Maryland, I'm just right outside of DC, both in DC and in Maryland, there are issues with historically black cemeteries. I can think of two different ones that are being desecrated and disrespected. And there are young people who get involved because that's a social justice is issue. And I see young people really stepping up to help with the work around preserving those cemeteries. I agree with Sarah so much because that was my thought um, how our history, people of color, our history to a lot of people never mattered. And in some instances, it still does not matter. And unless you have a, a family that had a strong oral history that they passed down to family members, in the future, um, those cemeteries are going to disappear because the people that are buried there, nine times out of 10, they may not the family may not know, extended family may not know that they're there um, or everybody in that family has died out. But um, that's, a, that's a lot of our history. And when you go places and you see that their headstones are missing um, in the cemetery where my, my parents are buried, um, they're weathered and you can't read them anymore. Those people are lost. I want to add to Cynthia that, you know, I post, I have to be very careful when I post on River City Cemeterians because it gets overwhelming how much desecration to Black cemeteries. And I remember you wrote, we really don't matter. And it was so hard for me because, you know, that. I can't say, you know, based on the evidence that anyone other than, you know, it seems like a handful of people that that's not true. So it, it's hard to sometimes, you know, support our friends and loved ones and say, no, black lives do matter. Um, when, and I'm thinking, you know, Sarah didn't mention the cemeteries and maybe it would be better not to, but I think I know exactly one in the 70s, they moved all the tombstones over to redo you know, the grass and then they never moved it back. I've taken my class there and, you know, and it has like a connection to the Underground Railroad. It's a huge you know, spot of history. And here I have a class you know, of college students and they're like, where's the cemetery? What's going on? Um, and there's a white cemetery that's you know, just right over the hill. Um, so it's really hard. I mean, we, you know, we have to do the hard, you know, have the hard conversations and show the hard visuals of cemeteries like that so that people can recognize that that history is so important to American history. It's all of our history. Well, I think that's a continual battle for the future is protecting these cemeteries that um, will be, if, if no one is paying attention to them and no one knows where they all are, that will continue to get plowed over and, and lose. You know, Oakwood receives a lot of relocated cemeteries and I so wish they could stay where they were, mm -hmm. not because I don't want them, but because they belong where they are. Um, but sadly, they're no, sometimes they're no longer safe where they are to development, to um, nature, to vandalism. Um, but it is, uh, it is a, I think it's a common issue everywhere. In North Carolina, I know, trying to protect African-American cemeteries um, that maybe have no owner, no, you know, no legal ties, um, you know, paper trail. 
uh, is it's heartbreaking. We cannot lose those stories. I think many people don't recognize that, you know, cemeteries are not all owned by the government or owned by a city, that some of them were private. Um, so that is, that's a huge thing that I have to explain to people when giving tours is, you know, who's responsible, someone, my mother even says, someone should do something. We're someone right here. So that's just a call out for, you know, hopefully people watching this too, is to be involved, um, you know, become aware, do what you can. Um, final thought before we close out. Um, where can we buy your book? <laughs> yes. Um, it's available on November 15th from Arcadia, so the History Press. Um, also, you know, wherever you buy your online books, um, I don't want to give the, the big, you know, companies any sort of <laughs> mention, but um, it will be available there. I'm going to be doing a book signing in Richmond and also Winchester, so closer to um, the D.C. folks, yeah. Um, so I'll be posting about that, and yeah. I need six books. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I and I said that you know I do. I have a on my um, event page like you can have a little author signed book plate that I'll send to you, totally free of charge because it's the book plate, you know. But you can choose if you want my. I'm not an artist, but my tiny little tombstone drawing, also with you know your name or whatnot, or if you just want my signature, so. <laughs> <laughs> nice so far everybody's wanted the drawing probably because they feel sorry for me and uh they they want to document the the weirdness um before we close i do want to give a shout out to a woman-owned virginia-owned business also a rural business um outside of the stanton area in virginia claire's cake company who made these awesome cookies I have to be careful because I don't want them to slide out of the plate. But I asked all of us to take a cookie and we're going to give a toast to women writers, to women in history, women that we don't know their histories yet because we keep finding out more, and to the amazing cemeteries that we have in this country. So here's to you. <laughs> Good cookie. Thank you Delicious. all. <laughs> Thank you.